Hello, and welcome to the Social Psychic Radio Show, featuring Jason Zook. In uncertain times, we must change our focus and priorities. This show will highlight social justice issues with the goal of expanding minds and increasing unity, love, and mutual respect for ourselves and our planet. We support the Black Lives Matter movement. Our show aspires to promote social spirituality, which simply means that by coming together, we can solve any of our problems, including the goal of bringing an end to all forms of hate, discrimination, bias, or oppression. We must protect our environment, reform our criminal justice system, and protect every citizen from police brutality. When we come together, it becomes possible to bridge the gaps that plague our society and divide us from within. We the people means everyone. Hello and welcome to the Social Psychic Radio Show. This is Jason Zook. It's a great pleasure I have the opportunity presenting special guest, Sherry Morris, to the show today. Sherry is a lawyer, a certified yoga teacher, mother, and writer. She attended Duke University and the University of Iowa College of Law. Sherry worked as a lawyer from 1991 through 2003, and since that time has worn many hats. Chief Operating Officer of a law firm, yoga teacher, and author. Sherry's legal training makes her approach to issues logical and reasoned. She began exploring alternate dispute resolution and transformative mediation in order to understand how to change the nature of conflict and improve dynamics when conflict occurs in litigation and otherwise when a solely rational approach may not succeed. Her approach to conflict is that rational thinking must be accompanied by the ability to empathize and compromise in order to achieve successful results. Sherry believes it's very important to understand and analyze each decision and divorce carefully and rationally, but with a strong consideration for your best self and a relationship that may continue with a former spouse well into the future, especially when there are children involved. Sherry had a long-term marriage with children, which ended in divorce. This deepened her desire to explore how to make a very chaotic and stressful life transition, a more organized, fair, and cooperative one when possible in order to serve the best interests of children and adults. Sherry's training as a coach was inspired by this experience. She strongly believes from her own and her clients' experiences that facing life transition with the support of an objective thinking partner helps clarify decisions in a supportive and accountable environment, and as such, it's very invaluable. There are many professionals who may serve an individual in divorce, but a divorce coach may help to be the only one acting as an objective thinking partner who will help you decide at a reasonable cost how to frame important decisions that will serve you and your children now and well into the future. Sherry is convinced that the best interests of children are served in divorce when the adults act as their best selves, inspiring their children to see that flexibility and resiliency are important lifelong qualities for all of us. This applies whether you're contemplating in the midst of or having post-divorce complications. Sherry has four children of her own, two of whom are in college and is part of a blended family. She's delighted to include her partner's daughter and says that they have a combined five. Life is always interesting and challenging. In addition to her work with Dear Divorce Coach, Sherry is available for coaching sessions regarding divorce and other life transitions for individuals and couples too. She also has various Washington, D.C. based support group opportunities available in conjunction with a licensed clinical social worker. It's a great pleasure. I welcome Sherry to the show. Welcome to the show, Sherry. Jason, it's a pleasure to meet you and to talk to you. It's a pleasure to have a fellow attorney on the show (laughs) who's spiritual and looks at compromising as an important component of life (laughs) and trying to resolve things and de-escalate things. And I think what fascinated me about you and having you on the show today was because of our prior conversation. I I like to have a prior talk with guests on occasion when it's possible. And I thought we just really connected so well that I I was just so excited to have you on the show and share your, your skill set with our audience, your perspective, your life experience. And that's what I think this is all about is helping others who are dealing in serious situations such as divorce or other life transitions understand that this isn't the end of their life. When we go through these kind of life transitions, and I was never divorced, but I've been through breakups and other upsetting situations, unsettling situations, mental health awareness is so important to me on the show. And I think you're such a pivotal part of that. And I'm, I'm so grateful to have you on. So well, my, thank you. my first question to you is, 
What is your perspective in terms of being an attorney, a yoga teacher, a mother, an author? What's your perspective on conflict and how can our audience understand it better to take steps to decrease it in their life when it occurs? Wow, that's a really powerful opening question, Jason, and I'm not surprised to get that from you. You sort of bring together all the modalities into one super space, which is really helpful because that is the essential question. And it's really my essential work with people. I've never been a particularly black and white thinker. I'm always somewhere in the muddling middle, right? Or the muddling gray. I see the shades of gray. I see the inferences, the nuances, the subtleties. And so I'm very empathetic about all of those things when it comes to conflict. And we all have it, right? We all encounter conflict. You don't have to be going through a breakup or a divorce to have conflict in your life. We have it at the grocery store. You know, we look around us in the pandemic and see the different sides that people take on all these important issues. So I think the essential issue for all of us really is when conflict arises, how do we manage it? And what I have found to be true, and and this is true of me, Jason, I don't accept myself from, from this category, is that when I am emotionally invested, I get triggered. And when I'm triggered, I'm not responding as my best self. So what I really seek to do with my clients is bring them to a place of neutral, which is sort of an artificial construct, right? We still have feelings. We're still who we are as human beings. But if we can take it down a couple of notches to be less invested in a particular result or a particular feeling, then usually we can look at the situation more objectively and not just through our own very narrow lens. So that's the work. That's the coaching I aspire to do and on a good day do with a client, which is to say, bring them to what is called transformational space. It's really about seeing someone else's perspective and not just yours. Because anytime, Jason, as you well know, we only have our own lens, it's a really limited one. And, and, you know, that's a fascinating example of what you just said, because I, I think it's so important to remove emotion where you can, but it's so hard because we're emotional beings. I'll say I'm expressive, as you can tell, but I'm definitely yes. working through my emotions. And I've done that a lot of work in my life over the last two years, especially. But how about someone who's not able to work through their own emotions? They Let's say they got cheated on by their spouse and yes. they look at it as an all or nothing. And they look at this person as the, the epitome of Lucifer. They're the devil. I want nothing to do with them. It's, it's me versus them and families take sides and kids are in the middle. What do you do with that kind of situation? What a great example. That's the quintessential divorce example, isn't it? It's adultery. It's there is one bad guy and there's one good guy and the rest fall away. And even though Lucifer, by the way, is now a really good TV show that everybody <laughs> should watch where you actually have sympathy for the devil. I think your, your example illustrates that, you know, we do want to villainize someone and whether it's cheating or, or some other betrayal, we really want to hold the space that there can be one bad person and one good person. And I'm going to say something very controversial and I'm going to say that unless you're dealing, and even if you're dealing with a serial philanderer, everybody has some responsibility in a relationship. Absolutely. And what I mean by that, Jason, is not that anybody deserves to be cheated on. They don't. Of course they don't. We make a pact. We should keep our word. We should honor our vows. But we make choices going into relationships. We make choices along the way. We choose when to not pay attention to something, when to pay attention to something. We decide when we're going to, you know, go deeper emotionally with someone. There's not just physical betrayal, right? There's not just physical adultery. There's emotional betrayal. Well, what if you've refused to communicate with your spouse for years and they feel so shut off and shut down? So what if you go and start an emotional relationship with someone? You're still the bad guy, right? Or girl, as the case may be. So the question becomes, how do we really look at that more carefully. Now, this is not to say when a client comes to me and says, my husband cheated on me, I want full custody of the kids, I want all the money, and this is how it's going to go down, that I, I don't say, you know what, that's really shitty. And it is shitty, but also you have to think about something different. All of us chose to have our children, right, with a particular person if we have them, good for, for better and for worse, as we sometimes find out. So it's your job, not the kid's job, but it's your job as an adult 
to figure out how you can still work with that person to take care of your kids. That's your responsibility. And if you tell me it's not, then I'm going to tell you that you're wrong. And that may not sound like what a coach would do, but sometimes a coach has to hold you gently accountable to, to real solid values. And I can tell you that if that betrayal had not occurred, you would tell me if you were my client, that people need to be able to co-parent, whether you're married or you're not married. So I am really, Jason, and and this is a much longer answer than you probably wanted. (laughs) I am really about holding all participants to a conflict accountable. So even if you have been the one to do the bad thing, once we start digging down a little bit, we can find behavior probably in that system that doesn't serve each member of that family system. And we're going to focus on how to make it better, even if it means you're getting a divorce, how to go neutral so that everybody can be okay. How do you account for, let's say, a spouse who doesn't want to cooperate? Like like one spouse is all about wanting to cooperate and they have two children and they're doing everything they can to follow the guidelines of the divorce agreement or to follow the guidelines of custody. And then this other parent is completely combative, does anything they can to make it difficult for the other ex to the mother, for example, and the father, I'll say the father is a bad guy. The father, I, I don't mean to call him bad guy. I'll say in the relationship dynamic, yeah. he's non-cooperative. He has a mindset. He's not working to want to resolve anything or try to do things from the best interest of the child. And they're acting like a child themselves. How would you approach the parent that's dealing with the difficult spouse in light of that? So what I do is help my client, if I don't have the couple, right, if I have one person and has a really badly behaving former spouse who may be personality disordered, maybe is just that technical term, an asshole, whatever they are, whatever their issues, we have to start with the idea that we are never going to change anybody else. All we can do is change our response to them. So I encourage people to go neutral to not take the bait. And it's hard. Oh, it's hard. And it's, hard. <laughs> it's hard. It's really hard when you're watching, for example, in your, your scenario, a father not do the best thing you know that he should or could for his kids. But you can't change that. All you can do is do what you can do to take care of those kids and communicate in a neutral way. One thing I try to get people to stop doing right away, and this is something I think every co-parent that's listening could take a note about because we all do it. Don't ever tell your co-parent what to do. Communicate what you need to do or, or you think you need to do in a very neutral way. Never tell them what they should do. If you're in a relationship with someone, an intimate relationship, and they tell you what to do, most of us don't like it. When they're no longer your intimate partner, when you're trying to boss them around, what do you think they're going to respond? That just raises the ire, right? If raises you one finger chance. salute and say, go fly a kite in the middle of a lightning storm, right? I mean, That's basically, it. Go, you know, you don't owe any power over it. It becomes a pounding of the chest between the two sides. And then it's... Exactly. And so I say, go, this is what you should do. You should use a model of communication with a difficult co-parent that's called Biff. And it was developed by someone much smarter than me, a guy called Bill Eddy, who writes books about this stuff, Right. It's an acronym for make your message brief, provide the information, be friendly or have a friendly tone and be firm. And firm means create boundaries. So you can communicate what needs to be said in a way that doesn't give away your heart, give away your soul or try to tell your former partner what to do. Now, what you have to be prepared for is they may do nothing with that message. They still may not respond in the way that you think a perfectly reasonable person should. And you'll be surrounded, by the way, by co-parents who are doing it so well, right? The conscious uncoupling like Gwyneth and, you know, Chris Martin. And you'll think, I am the only person who can't get this right. But it's not true. There's a whole community of us and it's okay. There's nothing wrong with you. You just have to keep going and you can't change your approach because people like this are looking for that weakness, right? They want you in a moment to just say, I can't take it anymore and yell back at them. And then they will feel satisfied. So we're not getting them that satisfaction. And we're still going to try to do what we can do for these kids 
but there really isn't anything else you can do. And the kids see as they get older, you don't want them to see, but they also have to learn how to deal with this difficult person, this parent in their lives. So if you can role model to them good boundaries, that's a really great start. So many of our social ills are based on, right, all of this trauma we experienced in childhood. If we can learn how to treat people who don't respect us, and sometimes those are parents, and, and create good boundaries, we can be better and more successful adults ourselves. Very true. I love the fact that you stress the, the concept of boundaries. That's like my biggest that's like my biggest learning experience in the last three years of my life is having boundaries with anyone in my life that I feel like if they cross boundaries in my life, I set them back at where they need to be. And if they do it continuously, I just go on. <laughs> like, in other words, I think boundaries are so important to define yourself by with other people in your life, because the more you can provide your boundaries, you're going to feel more secure and confident in yourself and you're going to have better relationships with people. I think you'll have True. a better dynamic altogether all around if you have people respecting your boundaries in your life and you respect their boundaries. And it's hard, right? Because sometimes you think, I want to get closer to this person. And so I'm going to share a little of my tea and I'm going to let them share a little of their tea. And then we're going to be all teed up. But then when they want to start giving you advice about what you should be doing and you start to resent that, yeah. you notice, hey, wait a minute, this was just a work colleague. We didn't need to go there, right? So it's really important that we do that. I think as a society with social media, with TikTok, you know, it's it's not very natural now to sort of keep good boundaries, but I think it can be pretty impactful for real people's lives. I want to ask you about your column with the Huffington Post. Share that with our audience and tell us about it and how you got involved in it and how they can find you on there. I was impressed. Well, yeah, well, thank you. I, I think I, a number of years ago, reached out to um, the Huffington Post, to Ariana Huffington, and said, hey, I'd like to write for you guys. And she sent me to an editor. And so I did a column on something having to do with divorce. And from that jumping off, they would occasionally come to me to say, do you have some you know, words you can add to an article or do you want to write about this topic? And I translated that into a column for my own website. So that's not part of Huffington Post, but it's sort of based on this premise that all of us, like we used to write to Ann Landers or Dear Abby, we want advice and people want to know things about divorce and how they're feeling and what they should be doing. So I encourage my clients and, and anybody really, even if you haven't hired to, you know, me to work with you, send me a question, email me, and I will answer your question publicly and I'll give you some coaching tips. What do you find? I mean, being an attorney, I, I, as I'm a lawyer too, and I find podcasting start out as a hobby and I'm making it more and more my, my main hobby. <laughs> I want to ask you as a lawyer, like, how do you, how did you transition from being an attorney to being a divorce coach who empowers others and, and, and promotes conflict resolution, ADR, alternate dispute resolution, mediation, all those things I love as a lawyer myself. I was going to say, how did you take that and put it into your coaching and transition. So it, it was really my own high conflict divorce that be, started the transition. I always, as a lawyer, was more interested in mediating disputes than litigating them. However, my former husband and I had a litigation practice, so there wasn't a lot of nuance there. That's, that's um, wait a minute. I got to ask this question. You had a divorce with your ex-husband who had a litigation. You're both attorneys and you had a divorce and you had a litigation practice together. Yes. Wow. The, the, Yes, that's that's like the jumping off point for the drama. The good news was the good news was that at least one of us decided that things should not be escalated. And we did a lot of things right on the front end. And that was really good. The The cooperation around the kids was harder. And I think that it if you view, view life as sort of this black or that's white, then that can become very common, and very easy. If you can just Hold the space for someone else's opinion. If you can listen, if you can understand and allow it, I think you can do really well as a co-parent. Things don't have to be the same in both houses if you respect each other and if you're both keeping the kids safe. But you do need at least to know and feel comfortable that that's happening. And unfortunately, I didn't feel that was happening in our divorce. And so I explored what's not right here. I had a great therapist. I had a great lawyer. I had a great financial person. Thank God. <laughs> and the piece that was really missing was, in my hindsight now, a divorce coach, someone who could walk beside me, be an objective thinking partner, 
understand all these other professionals. And I think being a lawyer really helps inform what I do. I'm, I am analytical by nature. I'm going to, I'm going to apply a process to this, right? We're going to be organized. And we're going to say, I'll just say this with slang for a minute. I'd say you're, you're chief badass. Yeah, <laughs> I don't thank usually you. that on my show, but I would have to say that I would, I would say that any client working with you should be very impressed with your credentials and everything you're doing in your, in your niche, because from my vantage point, I'd love that. I mean, thank God I don't have a divorce. I'm not married, but if I ever did or had to go through it, I'd be calling you up being like, what do I do now? <laughs> and, and it's interesting because what I really want for people, it's not about, even if they come to me, I really want to get at this other person. I really want to punish them. They deserve to suffer. That's really about them. And so this is what I love about what you do, being the social psychic, Jason. You know we all have these layers, right? And you know about this intuitive stuff. And that's, I think, what we share in common. I feel the energy from people, and I notice it's their okay. own pain that's reflected upon their spouses. You're an so if, if we can peel those layers and we can figure out what's really going on with them, they're more likely to be successful in their separation and their divorce in all their future relationships, we don't want them going out and repeating the same pattern after all. I got to ask you something because I'm picking up stuff off your energy. And I do this in my show when it happens because I just feel like I shouldn't deny it. Yeah. But tell me about your interest of having a podcast someday. I love interviewing. I love talking to you. I, I draw energy from my engagement with other people and I continue to love to learn. So I could talk to people all day long about what they do. That's why when I just mentioned what, what you're doing, I'm as interested in that as you talking to me about what I do. I think I would very much enjoy having a podcast. I also love being a guest on podcasts, okay. you know, and then it's not my responsibility. <laughs> well, I'll say this to you because as we're talking, I just feel like you have so much passion in what you're doing and your, 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 your message is so critical and so important. And literally in my life right now, and I just brought up one person yesterday. And as I'm talking to you, I'm thinking about another example. So I had a client yesterday going through really bad issues in a, a divorce setting. And then I have someone I work with that's going through, uh, they had a mediation today for their divorce and that's been horrendous. And so I feel like I'm going to have to <laughs> let them know. By the way, if you feel hopeless, don't feel hopeless. Contact Sherry Morris. <laughs> yes, and I and I always do a consultation because I want to see where people are, where their energy is, where my energy is. Is it a good fit? I'm not going to work with you if I think I can't be of support. But one, one thing you just mentioned, a mediation that's not going well. These traditional legal mediations can be as bad as litigation, right? They're yes. very pos positional. They're very transactional. I'm a big believer in facilitated conversations. Some people say, I can't be in the same room as my ex. And it's always funny to me because usually these people, like me, I'm, I'm mocking myself, have like four children like I do. So at some point, you were in the same room with this person. <laughs> if you could tolerate that then I think you can tolerate a facilitated conversation. So what I like to do is get people to talk to each other. Tell me your pain point and let's listen to his. And now let him reflect upon what you've said. When we do that, we really create new understanding. Now, this isn't easy. And most lawyer types like us, Jason, want nothing to do with it. They hate this stuff. They're like, that's touchy-feely. That's therapeutic. It's not therapeutic. It's really? listening empathetic. It's it's right. It's communication. And it's the heart of conflict resolution. So that, in my opinion, is where a lot of lawyers go wrong. They're not really trying to resolve disputes. They're trying to make a deal. And that's a very different thing. That's problematic because sometimes those deals don't benefit the client. Sometimes those deals are a negotiated attempt to resolve litigation, but not necessarily resolving the underlying issues that cause the litigation. You are so that's so true. And even if we can't get to everything right, because we're not conducting a therapy session, at least we can allow people to be heard and maybe touch on a couple of essential issues that can be addressed. You know, one of the things I find interesting with the people in my life who've gone through divorce, especially the ones with children, I just don't understand the, the spouse that's the that's the villain. I hate to say it that way, but like, let's say a close friend of mine is going through a divorce and the other spouse is just does everything they can to make it as difficult as possible, doing whatever they can to just throw fire on an injured situation. And it's so like, from my vantage point, I came from a single parent family in the seventies. My mom was a single parent mom. We had a very chaotic first few years of my life with my dad being who he was. And 
I saw firsthand what it feels like when you go through those kind of situations. My mom did an amazing job keeping the family together, but I got to witness firsthand how bad it can be for a child to experience parents that fight with each other, parents who ignore their child, like my dad did to me, or having the the, the conflict in, in the environment to cause tension. And, you know, you might feel on the surface, things are calm, but underneath you got all these underlying tensions that create so many layers. If you think of an onion, so many layers and so many, a complication. And I guess one of the things I want to ask you is when you work with your clients and they go through their life transition of if it's a divorce or whatever it is, how do you see them afterwards when they get through this process to get themselves in the best perspective possible to, to not fall apart? Because I know a lot of people fall apart emotionally and they shut down and it's hard. It's really hard. I, I, I can just, I applaud you for being a divorce coach. We need well, more. Thank you. I, I think the key is really for all of us. I, my company, although I have a website called Dear Divorce Coach, my company is Life Transitions Matter. And one thing we know is life is going to transition. So we are all moving through transitions all of the time. And what I find is if we can find a kernel of hope, something to look forward to, no matter if you are a child, a young adult, a middle-aged adult, or an old person, we all need that next thing. And if we can create that hope, that, that participation, that looking forward, that keeps us from the bitterness, the stuck. I call it, you know, the victim space. Mm -hmm. Everything bad happened to me. I can't move forward. It's all someone else's fault. So it's creating that incentive. And, and if I may just share a brief, brief personal story, I was also raised in a blended family as a child. And I just returned from a 70th birthday celebration for my stepmother. But she's actually my former stepmother because she left my father, now deceased, a long, long time ago. And for good reason. Let's leave it at that. She stayed in my life and was important to me. She was important to my mother. She and my mother got along very well. And my stepmother is now my only remaining parent because my stepmother actually hosted my mother's memorial service. So, so when you so talk, well, when you talk about blended family and making it work, I, I was, you know, living proof in the 70s and 80s that you can do it. And there wasn't a lot of structure around it. It, it was just figure it out. But what we found, I think, and it's not that everybody got along beautifully all the time, it's that what mattered were the kids, what mattered were, you know, showing up and being responsible adults. And, you know, there was some serious dysfunction, too, but the troops could rally around. The people that needed to show up showed up when they needed to. And so not to blame any one person, it takes it truly takes a village to be dysfunctional, too. Right. So I think the, the key to all of this is having the 10,000 foot view, not getting hung up on the fact that you have been the victim, even if you have, what is the outward looking thing? What can you look forward to? And how can you take care of these precious children that you've created? You know, one of the things I find as well is when you brought up victim space, I, I, I can can, I can relate to that. Like when something happens, you automatically think of yourself as a victim. It's the easiest way to do that. You want people to feel sorry for you. You sit in it, you kind of fester in it. And at some point you got to get tired of that to change your perspective and become empowered. And I wanted to ask you this. One of the things I, at least I, I went through two best friend divorces, females, mm. right? Cause I'm in my forties. And so you, anyone who got married in their twenties by late thirties, early forties, next thing you know, next chapter of your life. And one of the things I witnessed when I did, I wasn't a divorce coach. I was just a friend, but I was also a psychic friend. I found that when people go through these experiences, they have to rebuild themselves from the inside out. They got to rebuild their life concept. They got to rebuild their self-esteem. You know, that whole, oh my God, I'm 40 years old. Now I'm divorced and I'm single and I'm a parent. No one's going to ever want to be with me. Or you know, I, I gained weight during this relationship and I feel horrible. Or I just don't feel desirable. My self-esteem's in the toilet. I feel terrible. I'm sad, et cetera, et cetera. Eat bonbons on the couch. I don't know. Whatever you come up with, your comfort food. But I want to ask you about mental health awareness because of how critical and important mental health is. How do you work with your clients when they deal with mental health issues? Do you refer them to a counselor or do you do these kind of techniques where you teach them mindfulness and meditation and like, what do you do? I, you know, it's some of all of it, Jason. And I think one of the most critical things I can do is screen for mental health awareness. Mm -hmm. And if people are depressed or anxious or seem to have those characteristics, I refer them to a therapist. Absolutely. 
there are many things too in conjunction with therapy that we can do to reframe, right? Our perspective. Depression is real. Anxiety is real. I'm not suggesting that if you just reframe your mindset, you can overcome those things. There are chemical problems, right? That we sometimes need help with and we can get that help. And that's really important. But I also think it's important that we begin to understand and learn from what we consider failures in relationships, whether we broke it off or someone else did, who we were in that relationship. Were we our authentic self or did we gain weight because we weren't very happy? So we were turning to food as a comfort, right? So we were masking ourselves. So now is a chance to shed that, not just the weight, but the personality and revisit who we actually authentically want to be. We don't have to be whoever that partner thought we needed to be. So I try to kind of flip it. Uh, if you if you can think of it this way on its head, instead of poor me, it's what an opportunity. I get to start again. I get to reinvent myself. And sure, it's definitely harder when you're not in your 20s, right? You're you know, a woman in her 40s. I have clients who are like, you know, all the men in their 50s want women in their 30s. And But the truth is, those men you probably don't want anyway, I tell them, because if they're not mature enough to see, you know, and I see clients who are straight, gay, you know, polyamorous, whatever you are, there are good people who want to be with you. And the key is to find that alignment. And if we're pretending, and so many of us do, right, for so many reasons for so long, and we're not revealing our authentic self, this is a great opportunity to begin that change. I love that you just said that because one of the things I learned about myself being single for two years during the pandemic was figuring out my authentic self, at least to myself, to understand a lot. And I appreciate you bringing that up because it's so important that people think of that. Being lost in a relationship where you get lost and you're so enamored by that relationship, you start to kind of like do whatever it can to keep it in a certain in a certain direction. But sometimes you can become a codependent person. Sometimes you can you know, not setting proper boundaries for yourself and your partner can become negative. And how do you work with people who have codependent arrangements with their spouse and they're having conflict, but they're not divorced, but they're coming to you because they're frustrated? So one of the things I do, codependency is such an interesting category of behavior because it's so common, right? Especially, for example, in long-term marriages. If you have a relationship where certain partners have taken on certain responsibilities, even it can become a codependency, right? My husband drives me everywhere or he always does the banking. And so what I try to do right away is create some spheres of independence. It's a really good way to break the codependency chain. So even if, especially if they're going to stay together, but they have this conflict, I want each of the partners to feel independent and to feel drive and direction that will serve just them. And I find that really helps. It, it's not always that fast. And sometimes people require therapy to break long held codependency patterns. But it's a really good way to start, is to start being independent in ways that you may not have been in a relationship. What's your favorite thing about helping people through divorces that you haven't shared before, but it's something you hold dear to your heart and you appreciate in terms of your experience and life roles and everything else. Like what do you, what's your favorite part about all this? Well, let me give you the shallow answer to that first, because when you said that, it reminded me of, uh, this is the second time I've mentioned TikTok, which says I'm, I'm spending too much time on TikTok these <laughs> days. I saw a therapist doing an interview with a client and the first part was, you know, should I tell you, you know, how my ex and I met and then what they said in the text and, and he, and, and his response, of course, to the client was, we could start there. That sounds just fine. And inside his, his monologue was, I want to know everything. Tell me all the dirt. I gotcha. I'm going to listen to all of it. We're going to tear him apart and we're going to write the perfect text. So I have to say, I am on the inside, that person, like, I want to know your stuff. I want to know your business. That's not very good for boundaries, is it, by the way? But, but I want to know. I, yeah. And it's really honest, right? It's sort of like a little bit of a soap opera. The interesting piece, the truth is, Soap operas, you know, they're really only a few of them, right? That's why they used to have those characters that were like evil twins, because there are only so many things you can really do as human Alice, beings. Right? So <laughs> and so I see a lot of patterns, right? A lot of repeated patterns. And so I think the most effective thing, the most satisfying thing I do is when I can help people step back from those unhealthy patterns and see 
that they have a choice, that they don't have to keep recreating that pattern that's not serving them. So yes, I love to get all the scoop. I love to know all the business. And there is that piece of us that's like, well, as bad as my divorce was, it was never like that. Not even true, by the way. But, uh, you know, that's kind of, we all kind of want to feel that way about ourselves. But the truth is when you can feel that someone has gained some insight into their life that they may live a little bit better, that their child may feel a little more loved by both parents, that brings tears to my eyes, right? Like, that's it. That is why I do this. How often do you get that kind of feeling in terms of, of this kind of situation? Like, how often do you get to see the couple that divorces stay civil, act the way they need to in the best interest of the child, not be children themselves? And you can feel like good walking away from it saying, okay, this worked out exactly the way I would have wanted it to go. I would say 25% of the time. I'm not going to, I'm not going to pretend otherwise. Sure. In other words, it becomes a process. So by the time they are finishing this transformational work, they really are like toddlers learning new skills, but then they pick up speed and eventually they don't need me, right? My son who's still in college doesn't need me there to help him walk. He's got this. So eventually my idea is that they grow away from me and they may catch me up sometimes and tell me how their lives are going, but they no longer need me to read their emails to make them neutral. Or how do I respond to this text? Or what should I say to him about this? So the idea is the growth comes over time. It's not always immediate. It can take months or years, but, but the goal is they're running without me. You know, one of the interesting things that I've learned as well, as a lot of things I'm bringing up point of reference, but I feel like it applies to what we're talking about is the ability to forgive, let go, and to really turn the page, but not have bitterness, even though you're hurt and you're, you're healing, it may take forever to heal. How often do you find that as a challenge for your clients? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you asked about my clients, because if you ask me personally, <laughs> I may I may forgive you, but I'll never forget. Right. And and I don't really like that about myself. But what I notice for me as a human being, and I don't know if you notice this in yourself, Jason, that sometimes you think you've healed yeah. and you can be triggered. Right. You know, you can be every triggered day. And yes. every day. I have a situation that I think about every day and I don't know why it just happens, but. You, 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 you think you're good with it and then you'll think about it and you'll get bit, you're not bitter. You'll just get hurt by it. You'll feel a little slighted. Doesn't it give you compassion for your clients? That's what it does for me. When I feel that escalation and I st- and I have just told a client to stay neutral, get neutral, get neutral. And then I'm like, I just had a problem doing that. So reminding us of our humanity is so incredibly important. I am in this not because I have all the answers, but because I am a human being who's been through difficulty, who has used some tools, who has learned about tools that seem that. to work <laughs> much better than the legal system, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the legal system is the thing of last resort, I believe, right? You only go to the legal system if you have no other way of working together and get things handled. But I would say it's better to have the control and to, and to work with each other so you can control the outcome on your own terms. Rather than so true. Other- So true. I have so many clients who start with me and say, I want a judge to tell him what to do or her what to do. And I say, no, you don't. (laughs) Because the judge doesn't care about you either and doesn't know your life. And that outcome is not going to be a good one. It's never like the TV show, right? So (laughs) we start there and de-escalate from there. I can tell you this. When you said that, I just thought about judges. And I love judges. Don't get me wrong. I know as lawyers, we can never comment on judges usually. But I'll say, you don't want to go in front of a judge and test that bad day scenario where if the judge isn't feeling their best that day and you're going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time to get a really bad situation occurring. So if their wife just yelled at them or they have a teenager at home and it hasn't gone well, you don't need to be the one to take that wrath, right? No way. No way. Let me ask you this. How can our audience find you in the event they want to get in touch with you? Because I hope they do. I hope people who are dealing with divorce right now or complicated scenarios, you're a problem solver. And I think that's such a great thing. They can find me at DearDivorceCoach.com. And they can also check out a website for conflict that doesn't just involve divorce called Recompose.us. Recompose Us. And that's all about family, sibling dynamics, adult child with adult children who may have be tussling overseeing a grandchild, for example. 
it's really all about conflict. So I'm here for the divorce space. I'm here for the larger conflict resolution in almost any space that you can imagine. And I'll always talk to you. I want to talk to my clients before they hire me because I want to know that it's a good fit for both of us. I'll say this too. Looking at everything right now, where do you see the future of divorce going? Like, do you think it's going to be more like what you're doing as a divorce coach and helping in a more, I think it is heading in that direction from what I can tell. They're really trying to do collaborative mediation type scenarios. I'll ask you your opinion on that. Yeah, I do see more of it. Um, I was recently part of a Zoom session, actually, where they are working to create more collaborative processes in the UK as well, which is so encouraging. I think that people see family law as a special category that really shouldn't be considered the same as the rest of legal matters because families are involved. But it's tough, right? Because you do have to have some sense of standards and norms. So how do we get there? How do we create them? How do we create a system that that contains and helps and supports, you know, children and adults? So I th- I'm encouraged it's getting better. It's it's imperfect, like just about everything else. But I think the more we talk about it and bring awareness to the issue and stay attentive to it, the better it can be. When we discuss conflict, and we'll move away from the divorce for a minute, but when we discuss conflict, yeah. I, one of the things I thought of when you said that earlier is, how about couples who aren't married and they've had all this conflict during the pandemic? What suggestions do you give to our listeners? Let's say Terry and Mary are dating each other and they are just at wit's end, but they don't know how to communicate effectively. And they are just having a lot of problems with each other's relationship. And and they don't even realize it's the pandemic causing the external pressure on them. And it's interesting because what's the pandemic done? It's probably forced you with a lot more together time, right? It's forced you to be intimate in ways maybe that it would have taken much longer in the natural world. And so I, what I really ask people to do is to take a step back, not necessarily away from each other, but a little bit away in the sense of take a breath, understand what it is that's not working. And we're going to rebuild. It's like taking a Lego system apart in a way we're going to rebuild brick brick by brick. So let's figure out how you got where you are. Let's understand it. Let's explain it. Take a deep breath and start building again. I love that. What do you think in terms of how to incorporate spirituality into what you do? Wow, that's a, you know, that's a great question, especially today. There's a fellow divorce coach that I work with who was working to get her son into a wilderness program, and her co-parent was giving her difficulty about it and was really challenging her. And she said, you know, maybe you have to go to court about this. And I said, first of all, no, because no judge is going to say you have to go to wilderness, right? Like these programs are very specialized. But beyond that, wait, allow the universe to hold this just for a minute. Give it a minute. Well, it turns out her former husband talked to the high school principal where the son's attending school about this program. And the principal said, guess what? I sent my son to that program. And it's like, how could that ever happen in this you know, random space? Of, I call and, it synchronicity, like, but yeah, that's a beautiful blessing in that situation because now the father is looking at it from a different lens, thinking if the principal is allowing his child to go, I should let mine. And, you know, and so from my perspective, Jason, it's all about those moments. I'm not always good at waiting for synchronicity. I am, tend to be someone who wants to charge in and get it done. But when I do allow it, when I allow space and time, sometimes it's just okay and it works out. And so being less proactive sometimes really benefits the whole system. I was just thinking of something. When, when you watch TV from the 80s and 90s and you think about the topic of the resolving issues and relationships, you know, the sitcoms and they have oh, the yeah. pillows with the, you hit each other and the, do they do that in real life still? Or is that something that's just for comedy and for sitcom basis? You know, maybe I should bring that back because it would be cathartic. It would actually be cathartic probably for my clients to use on me sometimes, too, when I'm holding them gently accountable. Look, we all are going to get mad, right? And we're all going to irritate each other. Like, it's how we deal with it when it comes up, right? There's a way to not make the other person feel shamed or blamed. There's a way to take responsibility for who we are, even though we may feel shame and blame. So we're all bringing, as you said, all these childhood traumas, and then we're having relationships with each other. So if we can always 
give each other grace and take a minute to explore the dynamic of what's really going on, how my mother's words are showing up in my voice and how his father behaved this way too, then I think we have more understanding. And when we have more understanding, we just do better with each other. What's your favorite thing about teaching de-escalating situations? I think my favorite thing, honestly, is when it works for me. And that's because I tend to be someone who wants to be right. I tend to like to know the most of everyone in the room about any given subject, even though I may not. And so I really like it when I can give myself grace and space and understand that I don't have to be that person and that it's okay that I don't. Even if it makes me feel uncomfortable, I can feel calm. And that, so really the teacher is, right, the student. And that's, that's what the best part of this whole practice is for me, is learning to do it myself. I love that. I was ask you this. I know we talked a lot about divorce. Tell our audience about the other type of things that you do in terms of being a coach and how you've worked with other settings, not just the divorce setting, but possible relationships or conflict in general. So a couple that I can name offhand this evening are a small family business where all the sibs or some of them were involved with mom and dad in a very successful family business. But one sibling had most of the responsibility, but didn't feel well compensated. And she became resentful. Well, what do you do? And dad doesn't really want to take a side because he loves all his kids and still thinks he's pretty much in charge, even though maybe he's not as effective in the business as he used to be. And mom just kind of wants to stir up trouble. So the way I approach it is to work with the person who comes to me and then talk to each individual in the system who will talk to me, get everybody's story, and then bring them all together and talk through it. It doesn't mean we're going to have a kumbaya moment at the end, but in this Mm -hmm. case, they were able to negotiate what seemed to be reasonable terms. And does it mean all the family drama is gone? No, but at least they're able to get to a point of some resolution. Another situation involves adult parents who may not have a good relationship with their adult children, and the children decide they don't want their parents to see their grandchildren. And that's really painful for grandparents, even if they haven't been good parents. Sometimes, generationally, there can be a transformation. So I try to work with those families to do some family reconciliation to see if we can see a path forward for a better better tomorrow to really reunite or at least on a limited basis, get a relationship between grandparent and grandchild. Where do you see yourself 10 years from now? For one thing, I will finally have all my children out of the home. (laughs) So I hope, I hope that I'll be doing what I'm doing in some form, whether it looks like the practice I have now or something else entirely including that media empire that you're so sure I can have. I see you as a consultant Um, too, by the way. Yeah, well, thank you. And I think one of the things I that's really important to me is having a home that all of my my kids, since I have four and a blended five, feel like they can come to, that we spend time together, that's in a beautiful environment that we can play and laugh and that perhaps bring their children to eventually. So I really want to be in a space of of work, yes, but really of connectedness with the people that I've raised and the people I love. I have a wonderful partner with whom I couldn't have done any of this post-divorce. And I just, you know, I want his life to be good too. When you left your divorce, did you find it hard to trust again to get back into another relationship down the road? How did you work through that? I describe myself as a serial monogamist. So my partner now was someone I knew during my marriage and felt that I already could trust him as a, as a person that I knew, not as an intimate partner, but I did already have a feeling of trust. I think that's a big hurdle for people. And I understand it. I didn't have that barrier in this case, although I think it always comes up. And fundamentally, I think it's about trusting ourselves. And this is why, Jason, because you have to know that no matter what happens in that relationship, you're going to be okay. So even if it falls apart, it's really about developing the trust in yourself that you have the resiliency to come out the other side, no matter what that other person does. Self-love is something they should teach in school, huh? (laughs) Just like, you know, managing our finances, two things they don't teach us, right? You're right. You're right. It baffles me. (laughs) I'll ask you this. If you were a spirit animal, which spirit animal would you be and why? And I can go first. 
I, I, I always, love to. I I'd love to hear yours, please. I, I mean, I've been doing it for over. I may want to pick a new one for in the next couple of months, but I always say owl, and I have have a little <laughs> owl to show you if I can do that right. But I say owl because I have two parrots. Um, intuitive. I like to see above the fray. I also am very big on wisdom. I look at things from a 360 point of view. Now keep in mind, I've been doing this for a long time. So I'm, that's why this is a laugh. But I also just admire the owl because I feel like they're very independent and I feel like they enjoy their freedom. Well, the thing I love about the owl, my grandmother was an, a lover of owls. When you started speaking of the owls, it just brought her memory right here for me. So thank you for that. Thank you. For some, <laughs> For some reason, my spirit animal, when you ask, immediately spring to mind, and in a way it seems not at all like me, is a wolf. And I think it was because it feels very empowering, very passionate, very, in a way, singular, very protective of its own and wanting to kind of, you know, really howl at the moon and say, you know, let's do this. We got this. So I'm not sure if that if I got that right. Oh, yeah, but that's what came to me. Well, you said wolf. I said mother wolf. And then you <laughs> like as soon as you said we're at wolf, I wrote down mother wolf because that's your energy. I just see that as like something you're so protective, so nurturing, so caring, so caretaker ish that that's in your that's energy. That's it. That's me. That is. That's that, that so you're you right. Jason. That gives you Thank a purpose. You. So you need to have that purpose in order to do the things you do and accomplish the things you do. And that's why for you, it's so important to be a coach because you help so many people with your skill set and your knowledge and your background and your training, your whole life experience. Yeah. And that's a hard thing to find out there right now. A compassionate, caring, neutral. Right. Person. Being able to come in and be a problem solver, basically, in certain ways. Yeah. And yeah. I appreciate what you're doing because I think your message is so important. And I'm so grateful that you share this with our audience today. Because, as I said, I, I know three people in my life right now that are dealing with maybe four this type of scenario. And I think having our audience listen to us talk about this topic and have such a great conversation about all the parameters of what you've been doing and your examples and your anecdotes are so valuable. I appreciate your energy, Jason. You're a unique individual and a really great host. And I <laughs> really appreciate what you've shared with me and the way we could engage with each other. So thank you for that. I think there are so many topics we can discuss around these parameters that can help people look at the situations they're going through in life right now, interpersonal issues, uh, self-esteem issues, self-love issues, self-worth issues, whatever it is, they can listen to this wherever they are, whatever they're doing, and they can at least realize that they're not in this alone. And they can understand that the scenarios that they're going through, it's something that is very much more widespread than we realize. And like mental health awareness, I think coaching and helping others and doing the right thing to help those people understand from a neutral point of view to de-escalate conflict, you're, you're doing so many good things because you're not clogging up the litigation system, which is more money time consuming in the traditional battle battle royale of divorce law. Right. This is a, a great opportunity. It's like an off ramp. And I, I think it's such a needed off ramp we need to deescalate, help people understand that it's better to compromise the best interest of the child, everything else involved and the co-parent. I think you nailed it. And that's why I'm doing it. And I hope to continue to, to spread the word. So if people, you know, want to just talk to me about what's going on with them, they can find a way to do that at DearDivorceCoach.com. I am here. I will talk to you. We'll do a quick Zoom. And and I want to stay connected, Jason. You're great. Thank I love you it. so much. I, love it. I just want to thank Sherry for coming on the show today and sharing such a, a, a broad wealth of knowledge, experience, perspective. It's so important. When you look at life transitions, that you have the ability to not just look at it from the victim space, as Sherry calls it. We all have bad things happen to us. Bad things happen to good people all the time. However, it's how you manage the bad situation, how you learn from it. And if you're able to gain experience to help not only enrich yourself, but all those in your life from your negative experiences or life transitional moments, Think of it as this. Think of your life as a book. And when you go through a divorce, you're on page whatever your age is. Let's say you're 40 years old. You're on page 40. You still got another 40 pages to live. And so if you look at your life as a book, if you understand that even if there's been horrible things that have been done to you, if you've been hurt by your ex-spouse or your partner, forgiveness goes a long way. Also, keep in mind how important it is to look at a scenario like where we have Sherry Morse 
serving as a divorce coach for everyone. Her information that she shared today, the BIF method, be brief, provide information, be friendly, be firm, and create boundaries. If you could think of something like that, that Sherry shared with our audience today, think of how many other skill sets she can give you. This show is all about introducing our audience to healing modalities, coping strategies, and spirituality, of course, and psychic phenomena. But it all goes hand in hand. We're not segmented. We're not individuals who are broken into pieces and parts. I believe in the gestalt. I believe in the whole. And mindfulness and everything goes together hand in hand. And I believe what Sherry's doing with her background as a lawyer, yoga teacher, mother and author, and everything else she does, check her out. Check out DearDivorceCoach.com. I'm going to have all the information in the show notes. I highly recommend that you reach out to Sherry, talk to her, say hi to her, tell her you heard her on the show and that you were impressed with our show, whatever it is. But I, I thank someone like Sherry coming on today. It's important for me to have us talk about de-escalation. Because in our society right now, everything needs de-escalation. If you look around, you see conflict, you see drama, you see negativity, think neutral, remove your emotions. I think that that could have a great impact on a situation. And also think of it this way. If, you're, if your spouse, partner, whoever it is, is treating you badly, well, you don't have to have it affect you. You can react to it in such a way that even though they're acting the way they are, you don't need to let it be who you are. And that's why I think Sherry's trying to show all of us. Be your best self. Approach things from a neutral point of view. Don't get caught up in the victim mindset. Practice civility and understanding, compassion. Those are all things that are very important. And empathize, compromise. Those are the words you heard us talking about today. I'm all about that stuff. Where you could mediate and meditate at the same time, it's a plus. So check out Sherry's information. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. Stay positive because when you're positive, anything's possible. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Social Psychic Radio Show. Don't forget to join us for another episode next time. If you enjoyed the show, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give us a review on iTunes. You can also check us out on Facebook, and don't forget to visit the Social Psychic YouTube channel. Until next time, it's a big world out there. Keep an open mind, embrace your paradigms, and know that the universe is always yours to explore.